we'll go ahead and get started with the next presentation. Um, before I mention that, just remember to uh, submit your questions to the Q&A and not the chat module. But anyway, um, our third presentation for this morning is Eyes on the Prize, Delivering Archival Content with Synchronized Transcripts in Hydra. And this will be presented by Irene Taylor. She's the Cataloging and Metadata Archivist at Washington University in St. Louis, and Shannon Davis, the Digital Library Services Manager um, at Washington University in St. Louis too. So you guys can go ahead and take it away. Okay, um, thank you so much for attending. Uh, my name is Irene Taylor and uh, we're sort of splitting the uh, presentation into three parts really. Um, you get me at the beginning and the end. Um, and Shannon has the middle. So before we uh, talk about the actual project. Um, I do want to give a little background on the um, collection, uh, just so you can better understand why it's taken us so long to provide access to these interviews. So the Eisenman Prize was produced by Blackside Inc., uh, which was founded uh, by Henry Hampton, who was a St. Louis native, um, and he also attended Washington University. Uh, at one point, it was the largest African-American owned production company in the world. And Eyes on the Prize uh, really sort of put them on the map. It was also their lar first largest production. They would go on and produce other uh, documentaries that were shown on public broadcasting, such as The Great Depression, America's War on Poverty, This Far by Faith, along with others. Um, but this, it is still considered to be um, the best a documentary on the civil rights uh, movement in the United States. When they shot the interviews in 1985 and 1986, uh, they were shot on 16 millimeter negative film stock. And then the sound was recorded on quarter, eight, quarter inch audio reel to reel tape. At no point, either then or now, have these two been um, put together so that you could have both the picture and the audio together. And that obviously was a barrier to access. Um, certainly the fact that they were on film, but then also the fact that they were never truly saved. Um, Eyes on the Prize was also the only black side production that was also edited entirely on film. Um, after this production, they did transfer all the interviews um, to video and they were able to edit on video. Uh, but again, with this, the first six episodes of Eyes on the Prize that was originally broadcast in 1987, they did not do that. Um, so again, just a big barrier to providing access. So back in 2010, we were fortunate to get a four-year uh, $550,000 grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to preserve all the interviews and the first six episodes of Eyes on the Prize. We worked with Color Lab, which is a, a film uh, lab in Maryland, and they were wonderful. And we got new preservation polyester film elements for it, which is amazing. We very much believe it's our policy, um, and it's still considered the archival standard to do film to film preservation. But obviously, that only got us so far. Um, we also, I did want to point out that there are interviews that were included in both the Mellon grant and um, the grant that we're going to eventually start talking about um, from an earlier, never successfully completed production um, that was shot in 1979 and 1980. And yeah, um, those proved problematic in the editing process um, and in the transcription process as well. Uh, so that brings us to last year when we received a $150,000 grant from NHPRC to digitize all the interviews, including those from the earlier production, and then reassembled them. Uh, as you can see, we got 10 bit uncompressed HD digital files uh, for the picture, and then we got wave files for the audio. And then they were digitized off-site uh, at Crawford Media Services, but then our digital archivist uh, reassembled them here in-house at the Film and Media Archive. So up until now, the only way we've been able to provide access to the interviews are through the transcripts. Um, they were encoded, 
They were originally done um, from the audio cassettes around 2004, 2005. Um, they were then encoded in TEI XML and they were put hosted with using um, DLXS, which is out of University of Michigan and is no longer really in existence, which was also a problem. So really briefly, our workflow before I turn it over to Shannon was after Jim reassembled the interviews, um, we then went back to the original Word document and made changes and additions to the transcript. One of the things we did um, was we added a uh, time code so that they could be synced. And we also added production information such as camera roll information, if there was a cut, if there was wild audio, that type of thing. We also added if someone coughed or laughed or sang. Um, we also did change our original procedures. It, originally back in 2004, 2005, we did record all the uhs and ums. However, over the years, we decided that that's not very good uh, procedure, it, that it affects readability. So we did remove all of those uhs and ums. And then at that point, we turned it over to Shannon, um, and she will now talk about TEI. Okay, thanks, Irene. Um, so the Film Media Archive transcribed the audio into um, text files or Word documents. So we had to migrate that content into an XML file. Um, so my unit created a document model um, using the TEI text encoding initiative. Um, we went back to the document model that we created for the original encoding of these interviews. So we had the basic TEI header, TEI body, um, we had elements and attributes to describe the recording procedures and equipment, um, and the basic um, speech elements for um, the actual interview itself. Um, so we used elements of the TEI for transcriptions of speech and for performance tests. Um, the TEI is divided into different um, modules, I guess, depending on how you want to use it. So those are just two of the um, and the modules kind of group together the elements and attributes that you would need for a particular kind of material. So we use the transcriptions of speech and performance text. Um, so the header used elements, um, like you see here, that um, would describe the source of the transcribed speech, such as recording statement element that outlines the type of media, the duration, the equipment, um, other transcribed speech elements that we used in the actual body of the text and for the interview included the incident and description elements, which we used when an interviewer or interviewee paused or sneezed or otherwise interrupted kind of the flow of regular speech. So uh, these are some examples of elements and attributes from the performance text elements of the TEI. So we use the SP and speaker elements. Um, to mark the text when anyone during the interview is speaking. So here's a little excerpt so you can see a camera crew member, the interviewer and interviewee, um, and the, the text um, is their actual speech during the interview. Um, our initial document model didn't include time codes, time codes um, because as Irene mentioned, we didn't, at the time these were originally done, we didn't have any means to deliver the transcript and video together, so the time codes would have really not been that useful. Um, but since we now have that ability, um, we integrated time codes into our document model, so we decided on the SMILE standard, Synchronized Multimedia Integration Language, which was developed by the W3C. Um, SMILE uses attributes SMILE begin and SMILE end to denote um, the beginning and an end of a uh, block of time. So we put this on the div2 element, which was how we uh, divided the questions. Um, and then we also use the SIMPD, so Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers time code format. So we have hour, second, uh, sorry, hour, minute, second frame. Um, and initially, the Hydra repository that we're using to deliver these interviews did not have support for the SMILE attributes, um, but we, at the time, had a developer on staff who was able to modify the code 
in our repository so that we could use um, an actual standard instead of just in an attribute that we came up with ourselves. So once we had this document model in place and incorporated um, the time codes and kind of modified a little bit um, to, as Irene said, they um, modified how they were transcribing the interviews a little bit. So we had a good document model in place, um, but we then had to migrate the content of the text transcripts into the TEI file. So uh, we employed student workers to perform this work um, because it mostly involved copying and pasting, unfortunately. Um, there wasn't a lot of automation we could do. Um, there was a little bit in that, um, let me go back to the slide. So uh, when we had the text file, um, you know, anytime we saw Cortland Cox's name, we knew that it would need to be surrounded by speaker tags and would be followed by a P tag. So we could do some find and replace to um, populate the tags a little bit that way, but most of this had to be done manually. Um, the time codes especially we had to do manually because the end of one question needed to be one second before the beginning of the next one. So we needed human intervention to kind of figure out and document each block of time. So uh, once we did all that copying and pasting and migrating into the document model, um, I validated all the files against a TEI schema so that uh, we knew they were valid and um, uh, well-formed so they could be ingested into our Hydro repository. So a little background on that, um, we recently implemented a new Hydro repository for our digital collections. Um, we worked with outside consultants because we had um, we had no developers and then we had a developer for a year and he just left us. So we had a very small window in which we actually had staff here that could work on implementing and maintaining and um, enhancing Hydro repository. So, um, I guess I should back up if uh, you're not all familiar with Hydra. It's an open source um, framework that um, is a digital asset management system. It's um, based on or encoded, it's coded in Ruby on Rails. Um, so we didn't have anyone on staff that had skills in Rails. So um, we had to outsource the development of this repository to consultants, um, data curation experts, otherwise known as DCE. Um, so they were really great to work with. We kind of passed on our requirements for a repository to them. Um, they seen this repository on another Hydra application curation concerns. They um, delivered us this final project product. Um, the, so as I said, it's based on curation concerns, but uh, WashU had some specific functionality that was really important to um, stakeholders across the libraries and especially the Lit Media Archive um, to do this transcript and video syncing, which we will demo for you later. Um, we also really wanted support for TEI because that wasn't built into curation concerns, so that was another uh, kind of add-on feature that we had to uh, incorporate into our repository. So uh, once the XML was validated and we had references to video files and the time codes, um, actually ingesting the videos and transcripts into the repository wasn't um, that complicated of a process. The longest time was really spent copying the files over just because the video files were so large. Um, but once everything was on the Hydra server, it was really just a matter of running a batch ingest command and this created individual records for each interview um, based on the transcript uh, XML file and then um, the video file would kind of be attached to the XML file to create an object representing an interview. Um, the batch ingest function maps metadata fields in the Hydra repository to metadata in the um, TEI XML header, but um, the fields aren't all one-to-one, -one, so there was some more uh, manual work we had to do with metadata entry following this batch ingest. Um, so things like title, um, I think creator carried over, but um, some of the more complicated metadata fields like subject headings where there were, you know, 10 to 12 individual subject terms didn't all get mapped over to the um, subject field in the Hydra repository. Uh, so a little bit more about the functionality. Um, 
So we have uh, support for syncing transcripts and video, so you can follow along with the text in the transcript and, um, while you watch the video, and you can toggle between the two. Um, and as I said, we'll demo this after I'm done talking. Um, so a little bit about the website itself. Um, we already had a collection website uh, for this project um, from the first iteration where, um, of um, delivering the transcripts. So modifying it for this go round, um, there was a lot of work to do. Um, basically, we included this little blurb at the top, thanking our funders, um, and then replaced links to the interviews that were in DLXS. They're now linking up to our uh, new Hydra repository. And then we also uh, included biographies for each interviewee um, on the site. So um, I think we're going to demo yet. So what it can do. Um, and hopefully this will successfully work at some point, perhaps. It's thinking about it. Aha. Um, so Yes, it's still thinking about it. Um, here we go. <laughs> here we go. And this has John Lewis. Uh, and I do want to point out. Oh, no. Uh, so yes, let's go to John Lewis. So as Shannon was discussing, you can either go to any. Oh, we are. Yes, press my first. Okay, go to any <laughs> point on the video. And it should then take you to that point. I think maybe we're having. I'm not sure. I don't know what to do. Wait. What should happen is when you go to any point on the video, it goes to that corresponding part in the transcript and vice versa. But we seem to have technical difficulties. Yeah, let's go back. I apologize. It really does work. <laughs> it does. It's amazing. Uh, and, and maybe, yes, if we press play and get it going, really, it does work. Um, <sighs> oh, dear. Uh, so sorry about this. Um, it really, it does work. It's still <laughs> buffering. I think maybe the connection is just unfortunate. Um, I apologize for that. I let's talk about other aspects of it. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, the description did come over from the TEI XML uh, document. However, um, we one of the other deliverables for the grants um, was to improve our catalog records, and we actually have an asset management system called Mavis, which is capable of exporting uh, in XML. And before he left, I had talked about our developer about incorporating the individual title level record from um, our management from Mavis um, so that uh, we can get so that things can be more automated because we did have to go in um, title by title and change the description so it's more descriptive of the interview itself whereas the tei was more uh talking about how it how the interview fit in within the series so that was one of the um, changes we made we did also uh, go in and sort of tidy up the subject uh field we did use verified you know we verified that they were um letter of congress subject headings um uh, for the 1985 and 1986, we knew who conducted the interviewers, uh, so we added those information. Sadly, for the 1979, the documentation is not as great, um, so we don't have everything. We did add the funding uh, information again under the funder uh, credit because money is important, and we wouldn't have been able to do it without that, so thanks to them. Um, I did, we'll see if this works. Uh, that's a good idea. Uh, we're going to try. Um, uh, um, let's see if he works. 
Uh -huh. Yeah, explorer. Yes. So this is actually his 1979 interview. Big one. And as you can see, they were not as professional. The hand <laughs> the slate is not really ideal. Um, where are you from and uh, how did you get into that? Um, I grew up in rural Alabama. So again, it about was, sixth, I left the sixth go. grade. So you can. So we skip rolled in old broken down buses and white children. So you come on rolling through. We didn't and have any. They want to see, oh, Greenbrook. The, What's that about? Okay. It will Greenberg. take them to that part uh, in the interview. We did try to have the time code around roughly two minutes um, just to help. Uh, um, discoverability. So, Obviously, so what you're saying people is you were being interviewed, and a lot of them were quite chatty. So we yeah, weren't. I think always we were prepared in, around two minutes. In Nashville. But we did um, so Nashville. to do so. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe this this will take them to the title record in uh, Mavis Web, which is the public facing component of our asset management system. Likewise, if they stumble, if they're searching in Mavis Web and they come across this interview, there is that link that will take them back to the uh, golden seal, the repository record. And then I think really the last thing I want to talk about is um, sort of this, this came as a bit of a surprise that you can, to us anyway, um, that users will be able to download the video. Um, we do have the rights to this material. We obviously want people to have access to it. We believe very strongly in that. Um, these, I, I mean, they're, they're decent access files, they're MP4s. They're fairly robust access MP4 files. Um, Obviously, if someone is looking to, we get a lot of uh, filmmakers who come to us running footage. Um, obviously, the, the MP4 would not be adequate for their um, needs. So they would then have to come to us to license the footage and get, uh, we have both, uh, probably we would give them our intermediate uh, file, which is a ProRes. Uh, anyway. Uh, but that is something that we will keep an eye on in terms of functionality. Uh, we are conducting sort of a feedback. Um, our curator, Brian Woodman, is conducting feedback from students, researchers, faculty, and filmmakers to see what they think of both the repository and the, the website that Shannon showed you earlier. Um, and we're, yes, so we are interested in how things work and if it's providing what people really want. You can also download the XML file, the TDI XML. We thought that perhaps um, uh, that would not be super readable for most people. So we, we were able to add um, the PDF of the transcript as well as, again, just another way of providing access to this material. Um, and that, I think, is pretty much all we have. I mean, yes, I'm so pleased we were able to show you that it does actually work. Um, I guess that's some the feedback is Internet Explorers are not <laughs> super great for that. Um, so did you have, Shannon, anything you wanted to add? If we're ready for questions, if anyone has questions. Sorry, okay. guys, it helps if the moderator unmutes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation, um, both Irene and Shannon. Um, we've got a couple of questions here, so I'm going to start reading them off. And please feel free, um, everyone who's attending, to um, keep questions coming. Um, so let's see. First here, we have someone who's interested in the all caps versus lowercase use in the transcripts. What was the thought behind doing that? Yes, um, that was a thought we have gone away from. Um, so we have over 400 transcripts that are in TEI. Uh, we have that. 
Eyes on the Prize was the first project that we transcribed. And not to deflect blame for myself, but I was not here when that decision was originally made. Uh, it was thought for readability issues that having all the production crew, the interviewer and the camera uh, crew be in all caps versus the speaker, the interviewee in normal text would help readability. We don't really think that's the case anymore. We did discuss when this project started uh, going back and changing that to conform to what our procedures are now. However, it was ultimately decided that as much as I personally don't really like the full all caps, that taking the time and effort to just do it in normal was not perhaps worth it. But depending, yeah, we might we might decide it was worth it. Um, but for the time being, so that, yeah, it's, it's a little unfortunate, I think, but. All right, thank you. Um, next up, let's see. Oh, someone found a login for repository.wstl.edu um, and wanted to verify that it was open to the community. It is, yeah. Um, the login is really at this point just for um, internal library staff here at WashU for us to add content to the repository. Um, at some point, many years from now, um, if we end up using this for our institutional repository and are encouraging self-deposit, then that login um, would be for people in the university who would want to deposit things like thesis, dissertation, research. Um, but at this point, it's just for internal library staff. Um, but all of the collections we have in the repository right now are free and open to everyone. All right, excellent. Uh, let's see, next question. Will you be creating an XSLT, blah, XSLT script for future film transcriptions to help automate the process? Um, uh, like I mentioned, there, it was really hard to automate this. Um, Again, you know, not deflecting blame, but you know, there is human error involved in when you're transcribing audio. Mm -hmm. um, so even if we did automate some of the tagging, which we, you know, we were able to a little bit, um, sometimes, you know, occasionally it would say interviewer, but occasionally it would be the name of the interviewer. So those kinds of inconsist inconsistencies really throw off any kind of automation we might try to do. Um, we definitely try to, you know, do as much as possible um, to avoid copying and pasting. But um, yeah, these are just, they're very unique materials and often not very, not entirely consistent. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, next up, how did you customize the display in Hydra for this collection? Um, follow up to that. Could you customize collection by collection, or does display customization have to happen globally across all of Hydra? So, um, yeah, when we were working with uh, DCE, the consultants who developed this repository for us, we had a big, long list of um, features we really wanted, and um, theming by collection was one of them, but time and budget constraints meant we couldn't do that. So right now everything looks the same. Um, it is not aesthetically different collection by collection. Um, we did customize an XSLT within Hydra for this display. Um, it was, so when things like, um, I don't know if I'll be able to find one here. Um, if there was like a pause, oh, there we go. Yeah, so this, um, big tag right here. Um, the way the style sheet was originally written, it was just picking up text within a paragraph tag, but um, things like pauses, sneezes, um, we encoded with an incident element, and so it wasn't picking those up, so it would chop interviews off when the first instance of that. 
Um, so we did have to modify the XSLT a little bit just so that we had the full display of the transcript in there. And as you can see, it, it is still, I mean, yeah, we yeah. shouldn't have that gap. Yeah, I mean, uh, we are still working on that. There's still little, little quirks about it that we need to work on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Next question uh, Was made this something that you already have had, or did you choose that just for this project to manage videos and transcripts? No, we've had Mavis since the early days. The archive was founded in 2002 with the Henry Hampton collection. And I believe, again, I was not here, uh, but I believe they chose and implemented it early 2003, 2004. So it, yes, we use it a lot for audiovisual materials. Okay, very cool. And let's see. Oh, also, we have a question. How are you um, preserving this uh, Eyes on the Prize collection digitally? Um, one of the things we're going, and I apologize, I meant to mention this, is uh, we will be giving the intermediate files, the ProRes intermediate files, the uh, metadata Mavis records from in XML and the transcripts to the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Um, I'm not sure if you may, probably don't know, but it was an initiative started, I want to say three years ago. Um, it is now um, uh, being directed sort of by WGBH in Boston and the Library of Congress. Um, so one of the ways we're going to preserve the digital files uh, and the metadata associated with it is depositing it in their repository. Um, that is happening sort of as we speak. Um, and then we also, um, we are working on our preservation uh, repository at the moment, now that we do have Hydra. One of the things I'm excited about, uh, since we're now part of the Hydra community, is the Indiana University and the WGBH partnered project, Hydra Dam 2, is what they're calling it. I'm very intrigued and excited about um, the prospects that they are working on. I don't know if Shannon wants to add anything to that. No, we are, yeah, like Irene said, we're working on our digital preservation initiatives here. Um, I'm sure most everyone else is. Um, it's a constant struggle, so we're working on it. Very cool. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple follow-up questions there. What um, kind of digital preservation policies does the sound archives use? Um, so we, when we digitize something, um, we digitize at the highest preservation level, depending on the format. We then make two derivatives, an intermediate file and then the access file. The preservation file, um, I mean, a lot of them are on the SAN. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them. Some of them are also on hard drives. Um, and same with the intermediates. Um, and I have lost my train of thought. I apologize. Um, yes. So lots of copies. And then we do take part. Of, this is not the first time we will have deposited things at the American Archive Project. Um, we were an early. Um, an eager adopter of that. So they do have everything that we had digitized that was shown that was on public broadcasting, which is a lot of our collections um, up to 2013, I want to say, um, is also deposited with them. All right, excellent. Thank you so much for that additional background. Our next question, 
uh, can you use Hydra for the preservation repository as well as the access repository? Um, it's sometimes, so the back end of Hydra is Fedora, um, which is sometimes talked about in a digital preservation context. Um, I don't really believe that it's serving that purpose here. Um, it's not really doing anything for us that um, having our files on the stand and running fixity checks would do for us. So um, I, you know, some people talk about it in that context, but I don't think, you know, we would need something a little more robust than this application. Um, like Irene was talking about Hydradam. Um, some people use um, Archive Matica in, um, in conjunction with Hydra. So I think you need um, maybe something else to go along with it to provide that preservation functionality. All right, thank you so much. Let's see, I'm checking here to see if we have any more questions about 10 minutes here if anyone would like to get some more questions in. I'll give you a moment to type those in. Right. I don't see anything coming down the wire, so I'm going to say thank you again to Irene and Shannon and um, let you guys go. If um, anyone thinks of questions later on, they can always e um, email um, Amanda or Central Plains Network and um, they can, those questions can be forwarded on to the presenters. Uh, we have one more presentation before the lunch break. And a friendly reminder, if you are not speaking, please do make sure to mute your mic. We're getting a little bit of um, fuzzy background noises. Um, so uh, that muting your mic will help with that. Um, so thank you again, Irene and Shannon. And we will step away to set up our next presentation. Uh, let's see, which will be Rescuing Texas History Mini Grant Program. Thank you.